this is a talk uh, called the Reproducible Build Zoo. My name is Vagrant Cascadian, and uh, I'll be telling you about the rest. <clears throat> so reproducible builds, um, uh, one of the main places where a lot of this work is going on is at reproduciblebuilds.org. Um, and what we mean by reproducible is packages with the same source code built with the same tool chain should come out identical bit by bit uh, so that you can simply do a checksum on it and it'll come out exactly the same. All uh, right. So source code, uh, hopefully you're all familiar with it. Um, tool chain, things like GCC or um, possibly even what shell you're running, like all, uh, but, well, actually the shell shouldn't matter. Um, and identical, we're talking specifically about bit by bit, not like it behaves the same or, or anything along those lines. <clears throat> so source code is readable and writable by people. Um, computers don't run source code directly. They run binary code. So how can we tell that the binary code the computer is running was produced from the source code? Because all of the claims about uh, free and open source software rely on the fact that the source code you're auditing, editing, fixing uh, is actually what is producing the binary. Um, so we can use checksums. I wrote a simple Python program, outputs two. Uh, wrote, uh, and then we, we've done a checksum on it, and then we did a major refactor of this code here, and uh, it still produces the same checksum. I'm really glad this, uh, this presentation format was big enough to use SHA 256sum. In my last talk, I had to use MD5sum because it wouldn't fit on the screen. Um, so, so here, uh, uh, you can take the result of your build process and make checksums of it. So uh, the source code plus the build environment plus the build instructions, they should result in bit by bit identical copies. And the important part is anybody can verify the result. Uh, this, is, this is the key difference between uh, reproducible builds and some other projects that have been working on similar things. Uh, like, um, so here, uh, uh, a random person from the audience could recompile a package that I built and they should get the same result uh, when it's properly reproducible. And there's a more elaborate definition up there. So um, there are some security implications to the fact that when you normally build a piece of software, it doesn't come out identical. Um, so uh, a while back, um, there was a remote exploit in OpenSSH that resulted in a single byte difference in the, uh, in, in the resulting binary. So tiny changes can make huge differences in the results. And more recently, and more specifically, uh, one of the things reproducible builds attempts to address is compromises in the tool chain, whether malicious or unintentional. And so in 2015, XCodeGhost was released, uh, uh, discovered, in the wild, and it was a compromised Apple developer tool chain, and it compromised thousands of packages actually in the wild. So the reproducible builds work that I'm, that the current iteration kind of happened, uh, much of the work happened 2013, 2014, but at the time it was this theoretical thing. Well, along comes 2015 with XCodeGhost, and it demonstrates that, in fact, this is a real world problem. We need to be able to identify compromised tool chains, not just to be able to audit source code. Um, how did I get involved in all this mess? Um, I'm a Debian developer. I maintain a number of packages in Debian, including the U-Boot bootloader. Anybody familiar with U-Boot in the audience? Yeah, yeah, figured. <laughs> um, so U-Boot was marked as reproducible. And I knew this just wasn't possible because I ran tests on U-Boot boards and every time I booted them, it showed the build time in the output of the binary. So I knew that was just not possible. It couldn't possibly be reproducible. The reason was we were only testing the AMD64 architecture. Um, so it built the tools, which actually, great, they were reproducible, 
Um, but the actual binaries you run, like on, a, on an ARM board or something like that, those still had unreproducible things in it. So I started getting involved. And I figured out um, I, can, I can build this infrastructure to test reproducibility myself, or I can offer it up to the community and uh, test other packages as well. So uh, just like in U-Boot, uh, where it was embedding the timestamp in the binary, one of the main things you can do to improve the reproducibility of your code is remove embedded timestamps of the build date. Uh, no timestamps, timestamps typically aren't the most meaningful identifier of a particular build. So you can, <clears throat> you can inject, um, you can just remove the timestamps, or if you really have to, if your project's been around for ages, it's always had to build timestamps, you've got somebody in your community who says, no, we absolutely must keep the timestamps, we can use source date epoch. Source date epoch uh, basically is a variable that's set in the build environment. That's uh, the number of seconds since the Unix clock. Um, so it's a huge, big, long number of seconds. I think it's approaching one and a half billion seconds, if I'm not mistaken. Um, <clears throat> so this is a specification that can be used to uh, uh, modify the binary, like uh, in U-Boot. We modified the binary to respect this environment variable and inject the timestamp it specified. And that way you can use something like this build was done with a particular commit ID, or it can be uh, a, uh, a timestamp from your change log, anything along those lines. Um, so if you really have to keep timestamps, uh, use source state epoch. But it's even better if you strip the timestamps from your code entirely. Another common problem is locales. So I don't know how many of you feel like you natively speak C as in Unix. A linguist would probably have a hard time identifying the difference between the locale C and the language EN, uh, uh, English as spoken in the United States rendered in the UTF-8 character format. But if you'll notice, uh, the case on the, the results on a sort are locale dependent. So we get uh, uh, you know, the capital A, capital B, lowercase a, lowercase b when you're sorting on that, and the uh, lowercase a, uppercase a, so on. Um, so locale, and, and there are locales that do even stranger things than this. So it's really important to take into account the locale of your builds. File sort order is really important. Uh, the file system you're building on uh, can actually render the files in a different uh, order. Uh, I don't believe there are typically guarantees on what sort order the files come out when you do a read dir. Um, so typically, you just have to add some sort of sorting mechanism to make sure your inputs are sanitized. This is probably one of the hardest ones. Um, the build path, uh, say you build in your home directory, you build in some temporary directory, you build there. That shouldn't, in most cases, get embedded into the binary result, but it often does, um, especially when you get into things like debugging symbols. This is kind of one of the main last mile things that we need to figure out for reproducible builds. There's been ongoing work in GCC and other major tool chains. Um, some patches were already accepted, and we're developing a specification that will be similar to source state epoch. So to the hardware, which is surely why you're all here. Uh, your typical build farm might look something like this. In fact, uh, the AMD builders uh, uh, that, are, that are doing the same work uh, probably look in a farm much like this. You have rows upon rows of nearly identical hardware. Um, and so I thought, well, we're trying to vary things like locale and the time of build and so on. Why don't we actually vary it at the hardware level? Uh, in this way, um, there are lots of random boards all over the place. I had a handful of them sitting at home doing nothing that I saved for U-boot testing now and again. But most of the times, they just sat idle. They weren't very powerful or anything. But it would allow us to get beyond this 
homogeneity of a uh, build environment. So in late, uh, late 2015, uh, we enabled a few build machines, um, some dual core and some quad core machines. Nothing impressive, uh, but it got the project started, and it also got our test environment to uh, work with remote uh, execution environments. Uh, went live in September, building around 2,000 source packages per day. But at that rate, it would take over 100 days to build all of the Debian archive. And then there would be packages uploaded in the meantime, which might not be built. Or uh, it, just, it was just way too long. So I thought about this a while. And uh, I decided, why don't I add some new boards? So the first, uh, the first four boards I added um, this was in the first iteration. Uh, one was a banana pie, uh, fairly low specs, one gig of RAM, dual core. Uh, it had SATA, and uh, another one, fairly similar specs, dual core, one gig of RAM. This is kind of a pattern. Uh, M SATA instead of SATA, but basically the same thing. A one-board quad, uh, this was our first quad-core machine, and it had two gigs of RAM. And quad-core, we could build a lot more with this. Uh, I think it gets roughly double what the, the other boards get per day on average. And here's another one, the Qbox uh, i4 Pro. Very similar specs to the one-board, uh, but for whatever reason, it doesn't seem to build as fast. I don't know. So then uh, I had waited for a long time. All the boards I could find that had SATA, it was a very limited pool of boards. So I decided, well, let's try a board with USB 3. Maybe that'll be fast enough to handle some of these builds. So we added the uh, Odroid Zoo 4. It actually has an octa-core with two gigs of RAM. When we first started building it, uh, it required a custom kernel build, but we eventually got those changes uh, applied to the Debian kernel packages. Um, I think most of the features were mainlined at the point. Um, but uh, it turned out to work really well. This has been one of our top builders ever since. Um, we ended up getting a couple more later. Uh, but they're kind of stuck at Linux 4.7 because of some USB issues I haven't yet troubleshooted. Um, so they're running with USB rootfs, and if the USB has uh, issues, that's not going to work so well. The other thing I wasn't super happy about was it required a firmware blob. But then when I was writing this talk, I thought, well, actually, that's great. Normally, I think firmware blobs are something we should avoid. But here, we want to provide an environment where we're testing. You don't have to test the build, trust the build hardware because we're dealing with reproducible builds. You can build it on one trusted machine and dozens of untrusted machines, and that can, that can still help verify the process. If the one with the firmware blob consistently produces a different result, then you know something suspicious is going on. But otherwise, it helps to verify that the firmware blob is actually not doing anything malicious. Uh, the other thing I didn't like about this one was it was the first one that actually used a fan for cooling. All the others had passive cooling, which was a little bit loud, a little whining noise in the background. Um, so once I kind of, once I decided, hey, that, that USB 3 system was working fine, I've got this other USB 2 system just sitting around doing nothing. I'll give it a try. It's slow. Um, it's only a dual core, but uh, it, it keeps up with the other dual cores with similar specs. And uh, that kind of opened the floodgates for the options. And this is when, up till now, I mostly had systems I already had on hand, or was this, the, the Odroid I picked up just because I was like, yeah, let's try it. It looks like a nice little board. But this, uh, once I realized USB actually is not the limiting factor, uh, it kind of went wild from there. Um, so I had another Raspberry Pi 2 sitting around. Added that to the network. Um, similar specs, quad core. It's getting a little bit, a little bit better build results. 
also a firmware blob, but wow, firmware blobs actually can be good in this environment, strangely enough. I can't believe I'm saying this, but here we are. So then we added some Firefly boards. And these came, um, the Debian project leader approved a grant to do, uh, to basically triple the capacity of our build network. 200 builds a day, even when we got it up to three, 400 builds a day, that just wasn't gonna cut it. So approved a grant request to uh, fund a number of boards, and these were some of the earlier ones that got uh, deployed. And uh, these have quad core, two gigs of RAM, um, and a really interesting thing with these is recently I got, uh, for a long time I'd been running them and they were running with the default CPU speed. And then uh, the Linux kernel got support for CPU frequency scaling and all of a sudden they were performing better. So this is one of those great things where uh, uh, I didn't have to do anything. I just kept pulling in the new versions and suddenly these boards started performing much better. And that was fairly recently. Um, we added some Orange Pi Plus 2 boards. Um, they're a little slower. Technically, it looks like they have SATA, but it's actually built onto a USB bus in a pretty suboptimal way. So their build numbers, their build averages aren't coming out quite as great, but they're still pretty good, and they were cheap. Uh, so they did a good job there. They also um, don't yet have Ethernet support in mainline, so I'm using an Ethernet adapter but uh, that's not a huge deal. <clears throat> so um, we got a couple more. Uh, these were the first boards we had that had significantly more than two gigs of RAM, 3.8 gigs of RAM. The hardware actually has four gigs of RAM, but the processor isn't able to access the full space of it. Um, so, uh, so these are very similar to the Qbox i4 Pro, um, but have significantly more RAM, and uh, they're, they're in some of our upper build numbers. Uh, currently, in order to access the full RAM using mainline U-boot, uh, we had to actually patch it a bit, so um, we need to work a little more on getting patches into that to do auto detection to detect the full amount of RAM. The BeagleBoard X15, um, which apparently is hard to come by, but uh, thankfully I got one donated. Um, is there a question in the back there? Yes, yes. We're building uh, the Debian packages from the archive, so. Right. So the question is, um, how do you deal with different packages, some of which being larger, taking longer to build, presumably, versus smaller packages? We average it over time. So the build numbers are an average number of builds per day. Um, and in the case of really big packages, some of these boards are just too slow to ever finish them. Um, so we actually have a timeout to make sure that the really huge packages don't take up the whole archive. And we've also excluded some packages from the builds. Um, that answer your question? Great. Um, so the BeagleBoard X15, um, hard to come by, but thankfully BeagleBoard.org donated one. I worked on getting support enabled in Debian. And uh, this one, despite only being a dual core, has really proven to be one of the faster builders. Um, it's got a Cortex-A15 processor, so that probably has a lot to do with it. But it's even faster, considering it only has two cores, than a lot of our quad-core A15s. So uh, that one's a bit of a mystery, but a pleasant mystery all the same. So uh, this is our first board that actually had four gigs of RAM. The Firefly has a four gigabyte variant. Um, we had a patched U-boot for a fairly long time, and then recently somebody uploaded patches to mainline U-boot that uh, supported detection of the full space of RAM. And this is great. I love it when I can just pull in other people's work and profit. Um, so rather than updating it when I felt like building a custom version for this, I'm just using the standard Debian U-boot on this one. <clears throat> And the Odroid U3 is uh, another mystery. Uh, it's only a 
It's got a Exynos 4412 processor. And somehow, for whatever reason, uh, it's actually consistently been the best performer out of all of our builds. It's got USB 2. It's got two gigs of RAM and a quad core. But for some reason, this is our fastest board. I can't explain it. <laughs> but um, uh, and this is a mystery I'd like to explore further. <laughs> uh, this also has a firmware blob. Uh, Bummer, and yet not so bad in this use case. Uh, the QB truck I got uh, a little bit later in the process. Um, and uh, it's been uh, unimpressive, actually. I thought, I thought it would do a little better. This has basically the same specs as the Banana Pi, but with twice the RAM. And it pretty consistently performs about the same. Um, but uh, it's one more to the pool. Uh, and this is a fairly recent addition, uh, the Jetson TK1. Uh, this has uh, quickly jumped up to one of the, it, I think this is typically around the second fastest builder we have. Um, it's got onboard SATA. The installation of the firmware requires this, this proprietary thing shipped from NVIDIA. Uh, which makes it hard to do firmware updates because I actually have to run it on a separate machine rather than upgrading it in place. Um, I would love to be proven that there's some simpler way of doing it, um, but as far as I know, that's the only way we can update UBIT on these. And I've struggled a little bit with the onboard Ethernet, so that one's also using a USB Ethernet. Uh, question? Really? OK, uh, so uh, somebody from the audience mentioned that uh, if you just force it to 100 megabit, uh, the Ethernet behaves stably. I'm glad I gave this talk. <laughs> um, this was donated by NVIDIA. And literally, uh, just about an hour before this talk, NVIDIA offered uh, that they'll be shipping me two more boards of the TX1, which is a 64-bit processor board, uh, which kind of segues right into the next board. Uh, the Pine 64 Plus, um, we've got two of them. Their build numbers aren't great, but uh, they just got installed in the last week, so the average build is uh, pretty wildly, it varies hugely day by day. Um, so those numbers aren't great. In fact, if we look at the stats from today, they'll be totally different. Um, but I've been following a lot of the mainline development on this, and just recently, a kernel from Linux Next could work with this, still needs a USB Ethernet adapter. Um, but this is our first board that's actually running 64-bit, uh, but I've configured it as a 32-bit user space. Uh, so this is really good for testing if um, some packages will occasionally embed the, the running kernel version or the running kernel type, or they'll actually, worst case scenario, they'll look at what kernel is running and then build for, they'll optimize for the running kernel rather than the running user land. And that's not a good thing, and this helps detect those sorts of problems. Uh, we've done a lot of that by running some i386 builders as well, so you can detect between different types of uh, issues. All right. So the troublesome boards. These were boards I had so much hope for. The QB board four, I think it's a octa-core, you know, one of those big little boards. But uh, it just never has gotten the mainline support uh, yet. Uh, it's a work in progress. Every once in a while, a new patch will trickle in. Um, similar story for the QB truck plus. Uh, Great looking board, two gigs of RAM, eight A7 cores, but it's kind of languishing. Um, but uh, fairly soon we might see something. Odroid C1 Plus, uh, I tried running a vendor kernel on it and it just was completely unstable. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't use it for a build farm if it was crashing you know, every time you tried to access the disk. So that one kind of failed. But the Odroid C2 uh, has recently had some great improvements in mainline. Uh, I've gotten it working with Linux Next. Uh, 
But the bootloader only boots over Ethernet, which makes it kind of hard to maintain uh, the operating system image. Um, but uh, given how good the support is in mainline, I'm thinking that might come online soon. And the LeMaker high key, uh, the high key boards have been uh, underwhelming to the wide world of the internet by most people. Um, so I'll put it up there. We got one donated by LeMaker. I haven't been able to get it to do anything useful. <clears throat> uh, it just uh, doesn't have sufficient mainline kernel support. Uh, it doesn't have mainline U, uh, it did have mainline U-boot support possibly, or it also uses EFI boot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's been some months that I worked on it. Um, but uh, yeah, so apparently there is mainline kernel support. And Tiano core support? And U boot, okay. So, yeah, and some of these troublesome boards, every once in a while, I get a wild hair and I go, well, let's check. Things have changed, commits have happened. Um, I'll, I'll give it a review again. Uh, sounds like it's worth reviewing again. Um, so, in upstream Linux, uh, one problem I've found on a lot of these boards is that because Debian uses a modular kernel, uh, frequently when people are developing boards, they'll compile in the support for all of the appropriate drivers. But uh, oftentimes there'll be bugs in the drivers that actually work fine if you build it in, but they don't work uh, in a modular kernel, or they need a huge tree of other options enabled in just the right order in order to get it to work. So that's been a bit of a challenge. Um, but at the moment, all of the boards we're running are using a kernel produced by Debian, which is, for the most part, a mainline kernel um, at some point, except for the ones that are kind of stuck on an old version. Uh, so we're basically running mainline on just about everything. Uh, the Pine64 Plus boards are just running Linux next. Um, a really... Uh, Part of what actually got me a handful of these boards was I offered to help up, uh, add uh, distro boot command support for a few of the boards, like the one board and the Qbox I boards and so on. Um, and uh, in Debian, that's a huge, huge uh, advantage to have that support where they boot in a consistent manner, no matter which platform. Uh, historically, U boot has had every single board has its entirely uh, individual boot logic. And that's really hard for a distribution like Debian to support. We have a handful of patches in Debian, including some distro boot command support uh, patches that I need to mainstream. And if anybody uh, would like to help with that, I would love it. And there are also some ancient patches in there from uh, long before I inherited the U-boot package that I have no idea if they're actually still relevant. So when I'm bootstrapping one of these boards, I'll typically just use dbootstrap or community bootstrap, which builds a small cheroot. Um, community bootstrap is useful for building a cheroot on a foreign architecture, although I have enough ARM boards sitting around that often I'll just do a native dbootstrap. Um, <clears throat> And then I'll install and configure a kernel, user, give them the appropriate pseudo rights, that sort of thing. And then I kind of do some additional package installation with Ansible just to make sure everything's the same. And then I hand it off to Holger, who is another person from the Reproducible Builds team, and he goes through and adds all of our, uh, all of our Jenkins test framework setup to the machines. And that's when they really get rolling. So, we use Jenkins uh, to manage our builds, uh, tests.reproduciblebuilds.org. Uh, it basically just executes some shell scripts that are installed on all the nodes, and then uh, it'll run one job with a profile. Uh, it'll say, you know, username is this with UID 111. And then there'll be a parallel job that it will build, well, not a parallel job, a second job once the first job finishes that will run with the user ID 2222 and a different username and in a different build path and so on and so forth. So we'll run two builds on each package build. 
and then we'll see if all of these variations we introduce produce a different result. <clears throat> and then um, once each build is done, it'll copy it to the build server, and then it will do comparison um, using the tool called Diffiscope. And I should have mentioned this in my slides. Uh, Diffiscope is this great tool. Uh, it's uh, sometimes been called diff on steroids. So it will take uh, the, you give it two binary objects, and then it will unpack them to the best of its ability using various methods of identifying what type of file it was. And then, uh, so say you're comparing two tar files, it'll unpack the tar files, and maybe, and then it'll diff the results of those. And if it finds, oh, there's a PDF file inside of the tar file, then it'll uh, extract the PDF file and then do a diff. So it results in um, really useful uh, diff comparisons between binary objects. It just, it keeps going down the chain until it finds something it can't figure out, and then it gives you just a straight uh, binary diff. Um, there's some amazing folks and uh, rapid development on that. There's also a, a web interface to it if you want to just try. It's called try.diffiscope.org. And you can just upload two files and it'll show you the diffs uh, between the two files. So uh, here we are today. Um, thankfully, it took me a while to put these slides together, so I got the most up-to-date information. Well, almost. Uh, we're running with 98 cores with 46.8 gigabytes of RAM. I think I did my math wrong. <laughs> um, and it's all in under 225 watts. Uh, so we're doing well over 1,700 builds a day. In actuality, it's closer to 1,800 builds a day on average. Um, and uh, so you can see here, uh, this is kind of the early days when we had the small build farm. Uh, and then we kind of added a few more builds just out of my craziness, and that got us to a certain point. And then we got the big grant from Debian, and we bought a bunch of boards, and a bunch of services were offline for a while because uh, for other random reasons. So even though we got a bunch of boards ready to be installed, it took a bit for the, the, the curve to really skyrocket. But it really worked. Um, so you can see, over time, we've averaged many, many, many more builds. Um, there are some improvements. I'd like to do the build system, but have consistently been backburnered, like uh, running builds in parallel. If we know the build profiles, we can run the builds at the same time on both machines to minimize idle time. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about it. Um, any questions at this point? Go for it. When building executables and stuff like that, uh, are you addressing the order? Uh, when it comes to operating uh, executables, because I've done some of this uh, building to executables, everything's the same except for the actual order that you assemble based on the line of executables. Right. Right. Um, I believe people have explored. Ah, right. Repeat the question. Um, so he was asking if the linking order potentially affected the reproducibility of builds. And um, I believe the answer is yes. Uh, uh, the link order does matter. I don't know what methods we've used to sanitize that. But uh, let's see here. Why don't I show you some build results? So. So if you'll see here, um, these are the build results for various architectures. Um, and it's too small to read, but let's see if I can read that myself, barely. OK, so this is the i386 architecture. Um, so early on in the ancient days, uh, that, that was about how much built reproducibility re uh, we hadn't built the entire archive yet, but once we get to the top there, we basically built the entire archive. There may be some packages at various points that aren't yet built. Um, the green part is the part that is reproducible with our cur current tool chain. Um, for the most part, I don't know that there are many, if any, patches that aren't yet in uh, mainline upstream for the tool chains, um, but that shows uh, that shows, this is for, uh, 
still can't read it. How about we go here? There we go. So, <clears throat> so the majority of Debian at this point uh, is reproducible, and this is for uh, unstable. So at some point, um, we were sanitizing the build path, um, and at some point, we sanitized the build path because it was too hard. But then at one point, we're like, OK, we've gotten this far. Let's make it harder. Let's step it up. Um, and that's a pretty common thing for various uh, projects to do when doing reproducibility is, well, first, let's test it with these few variations and then make some progress. And then once we're like, OK, that was, that was good enough, we make it harder on ourselves. So right around then, we started introducing uh, build path variations which really, uh, which I think reduced the number of packages we treated as reproducible by about 14%. At the same time, um, we're building Debian testing and we're not doing build path variation in that. So we have a pretty good idea of which packages are affected basically only because of build path variations. I know that doesn't directly answer your question, but uh, somehow we've addressed the linking order issue if that many of 25,000 packages build reproducibly. Uh, so I don't, don't know the exact answer, but uh, it's somehow addressed. Apologies. <laughs> uh, any other questions or ideas or things you'd like to see on the screen? Yeah. Right. We're working on some of this. Um, one of the main things we're doing um, is we create these files called build info files, and they basically list, um, we'll just pick a recent one. Hopefully it's not a terrible example. Um, so the build info file will contain, uh, that's not big enough for you guys. So the build info file will contain the source package, the version that was built, uh, the architectures it's building for, uh, where it was built, so on. It includes the build path because we're kind of in this middle ground with build path. We have some patches going upstream, but they're not ready yet. Um, so it tells you where we're building it. Um, and then we get some checksums of the objects produced. And and then let's see here. It'll list the environment. Um, so sometimes environment variables get embedded into the binary. So this will list what environment variables you have. It lists the source date epoch. And uh, yeah, we're getting close to one and a half billion seconds. Um, well, let's see if we can look at the actual build info file itself. Great. Uh, so here we have uh, all of the installed build depends. So it lists all of, the, all of the package versions that were installed. Ideally, we want to get to the point where we actually have checksums for that because the build version is trivially forgeable. Um, but that gives you the idea of the direction we're going with this stuff. So does that kind of answer your question? So we're working on some tools that will be able to basically take a build info file and then uh, run all, then reproduce the build environment with those dependencies and uh, all of those uh, build dependencies installed, and then run the build and then run it again. Uh, I think the one main tool we're working on is called ReproTest, um, and so that'll basically do some of that. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? So, so we've recently, um, in the last few months, we started building uh, ARM64 uh, as an architecture. Uh, we got a number of boards donated by CodeThink, and uh, they're one of the fastest, uh, fastest systems we've got. They have a, they've given us a number of moonshot cartridges, if any of you are familiar with those. And, uh, they pretty much just jumped straight into it, <laughs> rebuilt the entire archive in just several days, and uh, they've been keeping pace. Uh, I 
not sure we're using all of them actually to even do the builds, but all of our builds are a month, give or take a few days. Uh, we can rebuild uh, the entire archive. So that's uh, 25, 24,000 packages, depending on if you're doing uh, unstable or uh, testing. Did you have a question? Right. Um, the question is, are uh, you using any of these practices in other areas, such as continuous integration? Um, and I don't specifically know about continuous integration. I know other projects uh, are, are incorporating it. I think like the Tor browser was one of the first projects to do this, Bitcoin. Um, obviously, you can see why reproducibility would be important there. Um, <clears throat> We've recently started uh, getting, well, in various capacities, Fedora's been getting involved and, and getting more engaged recently. Uh, we've had uh, OpenWRT, so there are a number of other projects involved, but I'm not sure about exactly in continuous integration. I mean, in a sense, this whole project is a continuous integration project. Right. Yeah, um, it's still in its infancy stage. Um, we're, we're edging towards the possibility where uh, we're, we're starting to think about how the end user might consume some of this data. Um, so you might get to the point where a user could define, I only, want, I only want to install packages that have been verified by at least three different builders. Like, uh, so things like that, um, we're moving in that direction. Um, you know, so I, ideally, maybe you have like uh, EFF.org be a certification service for builds of packages, and then Debian builds a package, and then the maintainer themselves uploads a package, and then you have some other random user. Um, so anybody can submit build info files to the buildinfo.debian.net, and, uh, and uh, they have to be signed, I believe, uh, using GPG. Um, does that kind of answer some of your questions? Yeah, so we're looking at ways to actually use this. Um, we've been in the proof of concept phase for a few years now. Uh, we just recently got uh, all or most of the changes necessary into dpackage, which is the main packaging tool in Debian. I think they're making some progress in that direction with RPM. Uh, both the OpenSUSE and Fedora folks are working on that. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, so we've been mostly working on fixing these things in the tool chain, so we've been pushing things upstream. Um, we got some patches into GCC uh, that uh, allowed us to specify the, what is it, the, the debug symbols, paths, and things like that. But then a lot of binaries end up compiling the command line into the binary. So we made huge progress forward, but then we were still losing. Um, so we're working, that's why we're working on the build path prefix map <laughs> uh, specification. All right. Well, I'm running out of ideas unless you have anything more to say. Anyone? Come on. <laughs> All right. Well. Thank you all, it's been a good time, and uh, hope to see you all uh, integrating some ideas about reproducibility into your processes. Oh, before we retire this, for real, uh, no, not that. First, a word from our sponsors. So, um, a lot of this work for the past several years has been funded by the Core Infrastructure Initiative. Um, they've uh, really given us a lot of freedom to work on things as we see fit and really do what we need to do to make this a reality. Um, we want to see a more secure world where uh, things like Xcode Ghost are like uh, seen as a bad practice and you just have to fix it as a matter of best practices. So we want to see reproducibility as a matter of best practices and they see that and um, have helped fund uh, my and several other developers' work over the last uh, 
uh, me only recently and several other people over the course of several years. Uh, several organizations have donated boards. Uh, Lee Maker, uh, Technexion, uh, Solid Run, Debian, BeagleBoard.org, and NVIDIA. And uh, the Reproducible Build folks are a great team. Uh, if you go to reproduciblebuilds.org, there are a number of ways you can get involved, mailing lists, IRC channels, and so on. Um, so uh, we would love to uh, welcome you into our communities and engage with you. Uh, so uh, please join us, and uh, we'd love to have you uh, build things reproducibly. All right. Have a good one.